Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 10 The Phenomena of Induced Imagination I will now lead you to a consideration of a class of experiments more marked in sensational features than those related in the previous two chapters. These experiments are the ones usually alluded to as the higher hypnotic phenomena, although they are really as distinct from the hypnotic or sleep condition as the ones already considered. Any and all forms of the hypnotic phenomena may be produced without resorting to the methods of the hypnotists so far as producing the sleep condition is concerned. I call this class of phenomena induced imagination. What imagination is? The term imagination, you know, means the power of the mind to create mental images of objects of sense, the power to reconstruct or recombine the materials furnished by experience, memory, or fancy, a mental image formed by the faculty of imagination, etc., etc. The word is derived from the English word image, which in turn has for its root the Latin word imitari, meaning to imitate. Imagination and Fancy the imagination is creative in its nature and works with the plastic material of the mind. The writers usually make a distinction between what is called imagination proper on the one hand and what is called fancy on the other. By imagination proper is meant the higher forms of activity of the image-creating faculty, such as is manifested in the creation of literature, art, music, philosophical theory, scientific hypothesis, etc. By fancy is meant the lighter forms of the manifestation of the image-creating faculty, such as the ideal fancies and daydreams of people, the arbitrary and capricious imaginings, fantasy, etc. Imagination proper may be considered as a positive phase, and fancy as the negative phase, of the image-creating faculty. Positive Imagination Imagination in its positive phase is a most important faculty of the human being. It lies at the basis of active mental manifestation. One must form a mental image of a thing before he can manifest it in objective form. It is distinctly creative in its nature and really forms the mold in which deeds and actions are cast. It forms the architect's plan, which we use to build our life of actions and deeds. And, mind you this, it is the faculty used in the occult practice known as visualization, which is spoken of in my work on mental magic. Positive imagination is very far from being the fanciful, capricious, light, whimsical thing that many suppose it to be. It is one of the most positive manifestations of the mind. Not only does it proceed, and is necessary to, the performance of objective acts and the producing of material things, but it is also the faculty by which we impress our mental images upon the minds of others by mentative induction, and by the use of desire and will. Positive imagination is the mother of ideas. And idea is but an image formed in the mind. Webster. And the imagination is the faculty in which the image, or idea, is formed and in proportion to the activity of the imagination, so is the strength of the image or idea. And as is the strength of the image or idea, so is the degree of its power to impress itself upon the minds of others. So you see, imagination in its positive phase is a strong, real thing. 
but it is largely with its negative phase that we shall have to deal with here. The Nature of Mesmeric Control All of you who have witnessed an exhibition of mesmerism or hypnotism, or else read descriptions of the same, have doubtless marveled at the phenomenon of the subject performing all sorts of ridiculous and peculiar actions under the direction of the hypnotist. There have been many theories advanced to account for this phenomenon, some of them very complicated and labored. But I have discarded theory after theory of this kind, finding them inadequate to explain the mental processes involved, much less the underlying principle. I have come to a conclusion arising from my own investigation and experiments, which I shall give you here. This theory, or explanation, for it is scarcely a theory, does not attempt to go into the what is mind question, nor does it attempt to divide or subdivide the mind. It merely explains the workings of the mind in this class of phenomena. An explanation. The explanation just mentioned is as follows. I hold that the action of the hypnotic subject may be explained upon the hypothesis that his negative imagination, or fancy, if you prefer to call it such, is acted upon by the suggestions and mentative currents of the operator, and an induced state of negative imagination is set up. That is to say that, in hypnotic phenomena, instead of the subject's negative imagination being aroused by his own desire or will, or other planes of his mentality, such condition is aroused by mentative induction, caused by the mentative currents of the operator, and aided by suggestion. Let us see whether this is reasonable. Induced Imagination All of you know that your negative imagination may be aroused by outward persons or things. You hear a piece of music, and before you know it, your fancy is running along paintings all the sorts of pictures in your mind, and inducing all sorts of feelings. A picture may affect you in the same way. A piece of poetry or poem may lift you out of yourself on the wings of fancy. A book may carry you along in a world of fantasy and unreality, until you forget the actual world around you. Have you not had this experience? And, more marked than any of the above-mentioned cases, is the effect of a perfect stage performance, in which the world and characters of the play take such a hold upon you as to seem reality itself, and you laugh and cry with the characters in the play. You scowl at the villain, and tremble at the danger of the heroine. You glory in the hero's success, and shed tears at the sorrows and trials of the suffering characters. And you feel these things in proportion that your negative imagination or fancy is called into activity by induction. But remember this, the actors, poet, writer, composer, or artist, created his effect by the exercise of his or her positive imagination, while the effect upon you is induced in your negative imagination. The first is an act of positive creation, while the second is merely a reflection impressed upon your mind by either the suggestion or the mentative energy of the actor. In your consideration of the above, remember what I have said about suggestion in an earlier chapter. Suggestion is merely the presentation of the outward symbol of the inner feeling. The Mistake of the Suggestionists the radical school of suggestionists poo-poo at the idea 
of mentative energy having anything to do with the phenomena which we are now considering. They claim that suggestion is sufficient to account for it all. Without going deeply into a discussion of this matter, I would ask these gentlemen, why is it that the same words, uttered in the same tone by two different suggestors, produce widely different degrees of effect? Also, what is that peculiar personal force that we feel when certain persons suggest, that is absent in the suggestions of others? My answer is that the difference lies in the degree of feeling called into activity in the mind of the suggester, the degree of mentative energy released by him. And I think that any careful investigator will agree with me in this, if he will open his mind to all the impressions received during his investigations, instead of tying himself to a previously conceived theory. Highly Impressionable Subject Now here is an important feature of this matter of the phenomena which we are considering. The investigator will find that while the conditions mentioned in the two last chapters, the muscular and sense induction, respectively, may be produced in a large percentage of the impressionables, still there are comparatively few of them in which the more startling phases may be induced. Why is this? The answer is that there are a certain number of persons who combine within themselves the negative qualities of the impressionables, combined with a highly developed faculty or fancy, or negative imagination. This combination causes the person possessing it to be an idea subject for these strange experiments referred to. Such a person is what the French hypnotists call a somnambule, or hypersensitive, by which terms I discard because of their hypnotic association, and I substitute the term hyperimpressionables. I have explained the sense in which I use the term impressionable, the word hyper is a prefix meaning over, above, excessive, or abnormally great, etc. The term hyperimpressionables, as I shall use it, means an abnormally impressionable person. This excessive or abnormally great impressionability, as I have said, arises from the combination of a negative will with an excessive faculty of fancy, the latter being a form of negative imagination, remember. So you see that the taint of negativity is all over these persons. A Psychological Combination In order to show that I am correct in this classification, I will call your attention to the fact that an ordinary impressionable even though his willpower be the weakest, cannot be induced to perform the tests of the hyper-impressionable if his faculty of fancy be not excessive. And on the other hand, one may take a person of highly developed positive imagination, and our great people in all lines are such, and they are most difficult to influence in this way. In fact, they are constantly affecting and influencing others. The strongest influencers of men belong to this last-mentioned class. So you see, the ideal, hyper-impressionable, may have the combination of negativity and fancy. He is in a class all by himself. Let us examine him. The Hyper-Impressionable in the first place, he is most credulous, superstitious, fanciful, bigoted, and unstable. He is of the class whose fancy is easily aroused and induced, and whose general tendency is toward giving airy nothings a local habitation and a name, and to whom, when shown an egg, 
the next minute the air is full of feathers. He is also prone to imitation, and is inclined to follow my leader, rather than to strike out a new path for himself. He has but little originality and initiative, which are highly developed in the man of strong positive imagination. He resembles the sheep and goose, rather than the eagle or lion. He is always dependent upon others for ideas, information, advice, and often material support. His imagination is negative, that is, has little or no original action, and acts only, and easily, when induced or excited by another's mentality or suggestion. He has no executive ability, and feels easier when he has someone to order him around, and tell him what to do. He is a good copier, mimic, and imitator, and is often quite serviceable in positions where the work is mechanical and a good copier is needed. The mysterious and unusual has a fascination for him akin to the fascination exerted over some birds by a waving bit of colored cloth. He is governed by his emotions rather than his reason. He is excessively fanciful and imaginative, as the term is generally used, and has a decided hysterical tendency, and a disposition to see things and to feel strangely. He has many strange experiences. He has bought a minimum of self-control, and is apt to fly off readily. He lacks voluntary attention and application, and his mind is apt to go a-wandering. The only time that he can be kept steady is when some positive individual controls and superintends him. The excitable, emotional-colored man who gets religion at every camp meeting only to backslide next week, is an illustration of one class of this type. He takes on the mental states of those around him, readily, and accepts readily a strong, positive suggestion. These are some of his characteristics. The earmarks. There are many of these people in the world, in high and low life. But high or low, there is a strong family resemblance in their mental makeup. The two great characteristics by which they may be distinguished are, as stated, 1. A negative will, and 2. An excessive faculty of fancy. These two combine to manifest a highly marked example of negative imagination. The prize subjects of the hypnotists. Now, the reason that I have gone into the matter of the nature and character of the hyper-impressionable people is this. It is from the ranks of these people that the subjects of the hypnotists are recruited. If you understand the nature of these people, you will understand how the phenomena are produced. Of course, the majority of professional hypnotists deny this, and make great claims that their subjects belong to a class of people having peculiar qualities owing to ability to concentrate, etc. But every one of them knows in his heart that my above statement is true. Those who have had the opportunity of personal acquaintance with these subjects know that they all come under the above classification, with the exception of those persons known as horses, the name which the professional hypnotists give to people who travel around as professional subjects, and who play their parts just as any other actor does. These horses are trained to go through their parts and also to serve as bellwethers, or leaders of the flock of hyper-impressionables, who are taken from the audience. I know just what I am talking about when I make this statement, 
notwithstanding the commonly accepted opinion of the uninformed public to the effect that the prize subjects are just the average run of folks. Now, let us attend an imaginary public hypnotic performance in order to form a clear understanding of the matter. End of chapter 10